It's not always very gloomy in particular. Um, I'm so excited that we're all here. I'm so excited that Doc Mather is here. And um, I know we're just a minute early, but I'm going to lead us in an opening prayer and then hand this off to Gardell to introduce Dr. Mather. From the Song of Creation, O oh, all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise God. Magnify God forever. O ye angels of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise God and magnify God forever. O ye heavens, bless ye the Lord. O ye waters that be above the firmament, bless ye the Lord. O ye sun and moon, bless ye the Lord. O ye stars of heaven, bless ye the Lord. O ye showers and dew, bless ye the Lord. Praise God and magnify God forever. Let us pray. O good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the wonders of your creation, for the wonders of exploration and discovery, for the gift of hope and possibility in all that you have created. Guide us this day and always in your love. Amen. Thank you, Lily. Hello, I'm Bart Alpecki, and today is uh, my privilege to introduce our foreign speaker, Dr. John Mavage, presenting on a, an overview of the initial findings on the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched 17 months ago, and I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Dr. Mather is currently the senior project scientist at James Duffy. Thank you, Matt. He's so close, sir. Okay. Dr. Mather is currently the senior project Scientist. No. He is currently a senior project scientist on JW, a senior astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland College of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences. Dr. Mather is a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics, where his work helps cement the Big Bang Theory using COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite Data, with his co-recipient, George Smoot, in 2006. In 2007, Time Magazine listed him among the 100 most influential people in the world. And again, in 2012, they included him in the 25 most influential people in space. His work on the beginning of creation fits right in with our long Episcopal tradition and triad of scripture, tradition, and reason never hide from the revealed universe. We seek it out as it helps us clarify our wonderful place in creation and be awed at our abilities to get knowledge to unfold and comprehend the creation's mysteries. We look forward to your presentation, Dr. Matthew, and to the deeper understanding of our universe that we provide. Is 21 feet across. It's bigger than the rocket. So we 
a huge engineering project in the state of Manus Space, and it was launched on Christmas morning, 2021. So we're thrilled because it's working beautifully and taking great pictures. Closer, I think. Okay, do that. Is that better? There you go. Okay. Is this okay? Oh, perfect. Is this good enough now? Yeah, that's great. All right, thank you. So, anyway, uh, 20,000 people have put it together and ended up in the space and working, and there are 10,000 astronomers in the world who can use it. So, that's the plan. I will just show you something a little bit more about it. Uh, but this is why I've been interested in astronomy all my life. Where did we come from? And so, uh, topics on here we couldn't really address when I was born 76 years ago. Uh, so, we have now uh, discovered a lot of things that do give us partial answers to these stories. Where do we come from? Well, we can tell you the story of the atoms. We can tell you the, the laws of physics that sort of push us into being in some way. Uh, so, we can tell you some of the cosmic history. Uh, we can begin to answer the question are we alone? Uh, but we haven't found anybody else out there yet. Uh, so, but we're working on it. Uh, where are the neighbors? Well, I think there are living things uh, around other stars nearby, but we can't talk to them because they're not like us. Powerful, we'll find out. And so, here's the big question that was on my mind that's been on scientists' minds and other people's minds forever. Uh, does the formation of life here on Earth require a divine miracle or an ordinary miracle, or is it just really something that will always happen given a chance? So, um, my personal guess at the moment is life will always occur, given the chance. So, this is a guess. Nobody knows, but that's my guess. So, uh, obviously, we also want to know about all those science fiction stories we read. Can we actually go somewhere else? Uh, not very far, I'm sorry. We can get to Mars, but we can't really get any. We cannot get out of the solar system in any practical way. So, when you say, is there another planet we could go live on? No, not really. So, take care of this one. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to show you lots of pictures and I'll tell you stories. And I like to say, you know, it's not going to see everything twice. Take a picture of the sky and then we make up a story and it may even make a movie of how that thing that we see in the sky works. So we go from pictures of fuzzy dots to amazing stories. And it might be wrong. But we can be wrong, so that makes it interesting. So, uh, people have been thinking about this subject for a thousand years. Here's a little bit from the poet Lucretius from more than 2,000 years ago. He was aware of the atomic theory that things could be made out of some of the atoms, they call them atoms, uh, individual visible particles that were so small you couldn't see them, but they didn't have much tools to work with in those days, so they couldn't really prove it. Uh, anyway, we think now that he was right a thousand years ago. And this particular manuscript was almost lost. There was one copy that the medieval monks did not destroy. And, uh, so one medieval monk actually found it, and it was brought to light, and now we have printed up silly of copies. <laughs> so uh, there's the secret that they knew about it, and so we can tell you more now. So I'd like you to tell also how did I get started on this. This is my origin story for myself. <laughs> Research farm of Rutgers University. <laughs> I'm about a mile from the Appalachian Trail, where it crosses the corner of Northern New Jersey. And uh, just about the hill behind the picture is the trail. So that was a, a farm where bulls lived, and they were studying genetics of dairy cows. So when I was six years old, my dad told me at that time, when I, uh, you know, we're made out of cells, and tiny cells, and inside the cells are chromosomes, and the chromosomes determine your fate in some way that nobody understands. And we still live. And we may never because it's too complicated. And anyway, that's where I started off. And then I'm just going to skip over a lot of stories because I went to college and graduate school when I started to measure the cosmic background radiation. And my thesis project failed, and I said, and my postdoc position, and my thesis project failed, let's try it in outer space. So that became the cosmic background explorers that way. Uh, that measured the big bang, and I said, I'm have a little price. So you never know. Uh, anyway, this is a back to basics. So this is how astronomers look back in time. And you look back in time also, but you just don't notice it. Because light travels at a speed of 186,000 miles a second, more or less. And so we know that number. So when you see something far away, you can say, how far back in time are you looking? Just by knowing how far away it is. So this is pretty basic, but we all have time issues in our faces looking out. So 
Um, we now also have the ability to survey the uh, whole world around us, the ancient Greeks, to do trigonometry, they could measure the distance of the Earth, the distance of the moon, and they could not actually get the right distance to the sun because it was beyond their capability. But anyway, um, they could measure the distances. Uh, astronomers also have one other method. We can tell how far away something mean is by how faint it is relative to something similar that's close by. So, anyway, so now we can survey the universe and study the motion of things, and there's something called the line chain. Uh, we have something called the Doppler shift. If you spread out the light of the sun into a beautiful rainbow, uh, there are certain colors that are just missing because there are atoms in the surface of the sun that absorb those energies. And so if you see the same pattern in another star, you say, well, it's like the sun. And what we often will see that the wavelengths are all changed because the object is going away from us or coming toward us. So now we can measure the speed of something coming or going. So back in 1929, Edwin Hubble, Edwin Hubble drew us his graph. And each little dot on this graph is a galaxy. A galaxy is a hundred billion stars, more or less, orbiting around a common center. And um, well, stars like the sun. And what we show on this graph is um, almost all of them are going away from us at rather high speeds. And uh, also, the, the, the speed of motion is approximately proportional to the distance. So, this was a huge shock to astronomers. It was a huge shock to Einstein. Uh, and what we see is that the universe has an age. If you divide the distance by the speed, you get the age of the universe. And you may not get it exactly right, but you get it. The first time people ever had a clue that the universe had an age at all. Before that, everyone, including Einstein, assumed that there was no age that was infinite. Uh, unlimited age. So here we have the story of the expanding universe displayed for us, and there's no dodging it. So, uh, another little point there, a few of them in the lower left corner, the, the velocity is negative. That means you're coming at us in a few billion years. The uh, Andromeda the Nebula will come and combine with our Milky Way galaxy where we live, and it will be a great splash. So, <laughs> <we're going. laughs> So the problem had the wrong answer about the distance scale, which was a puzzle for astronomers for many generations. Um, another thing to point out that the, the, the charge says Lumetra. George Lumetra was a, a, a had a PhD in math from MIT. He was also a parish priest in Belgium. And he said, I can calculate Einstein's equations and they imply that this must be true. And he said so in print. Again, Einstein said that must be wrong can't possibly be right. Uh, and we took the actual observations by an astronomer to draw the chart and say, okay, this is really true. Even then, Einstein wasn't convinced. Eventually, he was convinced. So, now, uh, right away, the remainder had a visit to the Pope to talk about cosmology. And the Pope asked him, why doesn't this story confirm what we have written in the Bible? And George said, no, you should not use it for that. <laughs> We've got two separate territories. <laughs> so that debate has been going on for quite a while. Uh, anyway, there it is, the expanding universe, and we can't avoid it. So back in 1989, this little machine, it took 1,500 people to build, was launched into space, and this was my thesis project, grown up big. And who knew? Anyway, so and within a few weeks of launch, we got a standing ovation for showing our first results. And a couple years later, we got a, 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 what amounts to a standing ovation from Steve Hawking for this picture. He said, and this picture is a map of the entire sky, uh, showing how bright it is in each different direction. You see it's bumpy. It's cold spots. So they're not very different in average. But anyway, Hawking said this was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. Okay. <laughs> actually is we would not be here, or at least we couldn't explain how we are here, if there were not spots on that map. It says that the early universe was not uniform. There were hot places which were uh, uh, enough more dense than average that they could gravity to stop the expanding material and put back in to make a galaxy, to make a star, to make a planet. So because of those spots, we are here. So thank you, spots. <laughs> there were also lots of details about where did the spots come from, Just to explain the spots. But anyway, this was the, our story about the early universe, and now we'd like to say, well, okay, if that's true, then what? Uh, yeah.
galaxies grow and have to have a future. So, in the way the Webb telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, was intended especially to look for the first galaxies that grew out of the primordial material and everything else that happened after that. So, basically, we are using this equipment to trace our cosmic history. First galaxies, first stars, first black holes, all the way up to now, planets uh, orbiting around the sun and planets orbiting otherwise other stars nearby. What is our cosmic story that much as we can possibly tell? So, uh, the picture shows, and the text says, actually, this is an international project. We did it with Europe and Canada, and they all chipped in bits and sent us parts and sent us people to work with the equipment. So, uh, not to tell you too many details, but the, the, uh, one little bit is the Europeans bought the rocket. And so it was launched from, uh, on a French rocket from French Guiana in South America. So, Christmas morning, 2021. A wonderful gift. Because it worked. <laughs> so, uh, just a few stories about what we're trying to study. We are using uh, a telescope that can pick up infrared light, so you can't see infrared light. But it's like ordinary light, just the wavelength is longer. And it comes from cooler things and other things that you can't otherwise really see. So, a few charts to explain why we want to study infrared. So, this one says uh, we're going to study things you can't see because they're hidden by dust clouds. So, you know, when you go down to the airport and they look through your clothes to see if you're carrying something you shouldn't, uh, they use longer wavelength like microwaves or cooling waves to see past the obstacles in your clothes. <coughs> you get a blurry picture, you see, uh, and anyway, we have the same idea that we see infrared. There's a picture of a new star being born as taken by Hubble, uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And you can hardly see what's going on. There's a dust cloud, and in the middle there's a star. We can't see it. Uh, the Hubble has an infrared camera also, and this is what you get when you use infrared. You can see around the dust grains and through the dust cloud, so there's a new star sending out jets of material. So we want to know how stars like the sun are born. This is something right where we have to do it. So in an infrared camera, you see inside the cocoons where new stars are born. Second thing is, some things are not warm enough to send out light that you can see with your eye. Uh, so here is a beautiful picture of a thing called the planetary nebula. It sort of looks like a planet, but it isn't. Uh, this is the, the uh, death of a star. I mean, sorry when they get old, spin up material into space. So this cloud is coming out of a star that already exists because it's old. And so on the right hand side, you can see a magnified version. There are actually two stars in this picture. Uh, and one of them couldn't be seen at all before. Uh, anyway, we are learning how stars are born and how they die from this process. This is pretty really important because we, humans, and the, the most of the Earth that we see, are made of chemical elements that were not there in the Big Bang. The Big Bang gave us hydrogen and helium, and that's it. And, you know, everything in the house here is something else. So they all, well, all of those elements came from stars that uh, made them in their nuclear reactions in the center, and then they either exploded or just had a more general uh, disintegration. Stuff comes back out into space to be recycled. So you and I were all completely recycled stardust. So you don't think about it very often, but star recycled, totally recycled, it's okay. Um, so recycled, you're actually drinking dinosaur pits and breathing dinosaur. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been a uh, Anyway, it's part of our story. We are, uh, here's a, new, a pretty example of a star that we didn't know would do this. Uh, we watch two stars going around each other, and every time they go around, uh, one of them sends out a puff of gaseous material in the space. It makes us amazing and beautiful. So, this, for astronomers, this is not only beautiful, but it's a laboratory. And we say, now we can begin to understand and make the dimension. Imaginary picture in the movie with all the numbers, but exactly how does that work? The third reason to study the wavelengths we choose is uh, space is expanding. Those distant galaxies are running away from us, so by the time we receive the light that from them, it's infrared light. So we need a telescope to pick it up. So this is a, just an example of showing how the space is expanding and the light that we get turns into infrared, even though it was visible or even all throughout when I started out. So here is the first picture we released. President Biden released it uh, July 11th last year. 
here, uh, and it's uh, uh, an immediate source of wonder for its flowers. So what have we got in the picture? Well, you see it starting, it's sort of like the star back down there in the middle. It's just a ordinary star. And it's got the uh, six spikes sticking out because the mirrors that we're using are hexagons. So there's nothing to do with the star as the kind of telescope is designed. And then we'll have it in there, but there are a lot more galaxies. The galaxies are the fuzzy things in there. So each galaxy, 100 billion stars, more or less, except that big fuzzy one in the middle is even 100 times bigger than that. So we chose to look at it because we knew it would have the ability to bend space and bend and fo focus light. So uh, you see all those funny looking shapes, the pink arcs? Yeah. Those are highly magnified images of even more distant galaxies. So we're able to move further back in time and get more uh, details about the first galaxy that group. So astronomers are thrilled with this and, and they're thrilled with the fact that everywhere you look there's a galaxy. So this is a source of wonder for astronomers. It was a source of wonder for the engineering team when they built the telescope. And then we turned it on. We got pictures like this and the galaxy get repair. We were just so thrilled that it all worked out. As I guess some of you know that it's a pretty scary thing to build a telescope and then put it on top of a rocket and put it in But it didn't. So uh, there's many more stories to tell about that, but I'm not going to tell all the details because I think you have questions. Show you some more pretty pictures. This is a picture of five galaxies. The one on the left is pretty close by, and you can actually see individual stars in it. The two that are in the middle are in the, about to merge together. They're crashing together and making a big splash, which you can see in the pink areas. And the stars are being born out of the gaseous material. The top one has a black hole in the middle. So we're able to study that one and see how material orbits are around the black hole way to follow me in. So, as you know, a black hole is a thing that's so dense that uh, even light cannot get out of it. But we see them anyway, and we see material as it's falling into the black hole and gets hot and compressed, and then we can see that. So, this is our chance to learn how the black holes grew, and which came first, the black hole or the ga galaxy that it's in. Okay, I have another one here. Oops. This is called the Cartwheel Galaxy because it looks like a cartwheel. Um, and this actually is a galaxy collision uh, that you can see in front of us. The little red galaxy on the left went straight through the middle of the big one and made a splash. And you can see the splash wave coming out and the gas that was pushed out formed a new generation of stars and now they're lighting up out there. So we, it's again, it's a laboratory for scientists to understand how collisions work and how stars are born. <laughs> okay, this is a spiral galaxy, uh, and it looks different when we have their telescope. This one looks like a sludge through a sponge, a galaxy with holes in it. So, how the wire in the galaxy has holes in it? It's because uh, new, new stars have been born, like in this hole in the lower right hand corner. I don't think I can get my laser to point at it. There's a hole in the lower right corner where a new generation of stars were born. They're so powerful, they've sent out so much energy that they push away the neighboring material. And now we have a luminous ring of new stars being born, born around the edge of the hole. So can we learn how stars are born? And by the way, a little shout out to Judy Schmidt. She's a, 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 she's a great expert, the amateur image processor. She sits at home in Buenesco, California. She gets our NASA images to make them look better so you can see what's in them. So thank you, Judy. Uh, oops, don't get in too fast here. Come back. This is what we call the Pillars of Creation. You've probably seen pictures taken with a hole. Uh, this was different. Now you can see inside the cloud, we see stars being born inside. In the sort of middle right corner, there's a bright red object. It's a new star just poking out through the dust cloud. You can see there's a huge wind going through space. The people usually think space is empty, but it's not quite. There can be a wind, there can be dust clouds, and, and then, by the way, the dust is the thing that enables new stars to be born out there, so that's why we have to look at this like this to learn the history. 
we have a picture of the new star being marked right in the middle of this one. Uh, you don't see the star because there's a, a orbiting nebula around it. But we're looking right edge on into this pancake. So we can't see the star, but we can see the place where planets are being born back in the dark bar across the middle. That's why the planets are being born out of the dust. So come back in 100,000 years, we might be able to see the planets correctly. It's pretty quick. <laughs> So, obviously, we all want to know how this works. <laughs> so, we are working on observing planets from other stars. So, the way we do this one with the Webb telescope is we know from watching at one time that stars have planets that go in front of the star from time to time. The star looks like it blinks, it's a little finger, a little while, a little animation in there, a red corner is showing you that. Um, so, now we are able to say, okay, now I know there's a planet there. I see it meant over and over. I don't know how long it takes to go around the star. I can calculate how big it's the planet, how warm is the planet, and finally, does any starlight go through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope? And the answer is yes, uh, we can tell. Uh, and so far, we have big planets with all kinds of interesting information, and we have little planets like maybe like Earth. And so far, we have not found any like Earth in the atmosphere. So we're not totally surprised, but anyway, that's the big question. Are there planets like Earth? So the tool is not necessarily the right tool. We didn't build it for this, but we're using it anyway. So we'll find out. Uh, so we got pictures of the solar system, and it looks different when you have the infrared camera, which is a great old Jupiter, and see that Jupiter has satellites. Jupiter has a ring, and they can just barely see in the picture. Uh, and it even has an aurora at both the North and South Pole. It doesn't look red because we couldn't see infrared anyway, so we have to make up the color to show you something. Uh, we try to make it sensible so that it means something. But anyway, uh, more detail later if you want. Uh, we got, uh, oh, we hacked an asteroid. We wanted to know if you push an asteroid, what will happen? So we need to protect the Earth because we know um, there are a lot of asteroids out there, and once in a while they hurt. Crater in I've seen with my own eyes. There's the uh, one in that happened in Siberia in 1908 or so, not down trees for 25 miles around. Uh, and there's one that fell in Chelyabinsk uh, just a few years ago, and a lot of people were hurt because they were hurt by the glass windows falling in on them. So we do have to watch. And if you can tell in advance, you can actually intercept them and move them. So, anyway, this was the purpose of this project. We crashed a piece of metal into the asteroid. And you, the pictures show that debris came out, and we were able to measure what happened and how much did we move the asteroid. So, very important for planetary protection. We hope we don't need it anytime soon, but we're watching. We are making the catalog of all the things that have hurt us. So, we, and we're interested in places like Titan. Titan is a fascinating moon of Saturn. Saturn is just the next planet out after Jupiter. It's a, it's a remarkable satellite. It's big enough to have its own atmosphere. It's mostly nitrogen, and it's really cold. So the surface of Titan has geological features. It has lakes and rivers and rain and clouds and fog and haze. And what is it? It's hydrocarbons. And the surface is actually solid ice. So this is a place to go hopping around and ready to build a helicopter to go fly around on Titan. There's a picture of it. We're landing in 2034. Project. So, if you think life could be different from what we have here on Earth, this is the place to look because there's a lot of the ingredients for completely different conditions. Uh, some more pretty pictures. There's Neptune uh, with his or her own rings out there and satellites. And after Greek mythology, here is Uranus. Named after Shakespearean characters. And uh, this one's the one, so, uh, one planet in the solar system where the spin of the planet is in a orbital plane. So that's how we get to look at the North Pole, the South Pole of it. So, and you see, like the, all the others, it has rings. So we're just learning how they all work. Uh, this one has clouds and weather also. And it's really hard to get there, so we're not going back anytime soon. So this is our time. This is our 
that's a shot at all you've got all those projects way out there. So there's a way for you to follow us online. Of course, we post everything uh, and social media. You can find your pictures if you just Google or search for images. So if you follow us along, and I want to wrap up with my favorite poem. Next book, the story of the Adams, with the story of us, and to master this subject. I don't know what was the poem talking about here. I carry your heart in my heart. So, if you want to keep that there are the questions, and I'll be happy to have questions to see if I can answer them. Okay, so, uh, I got a question right in front of So, so, Belief and God, like of creation and such, how do we know, like, doesn't that tie into the beliefs between, like, religion and creation? Yeah, so the question is about the, the comparative story that we tell in the Bible and in, and in the observations. So, I guess, the, I think we have to go back to what George Demetrius said, and he said, actually, we should be looking at the, re the revealed universe, and it was mentioned in the introduction. The revealed universe is a gift from God. We may not know the right story until we look. So, good question. Everybody's got that question. But it's I can ask it's not just, a, just a good point to mention that uh, we've got 8 billion people, so we have 8 billion religions. We don't agree, you know? Mm -hmm. I just don't agree. I'll interrupt because I have to leave. These pictures show the universe is so vast. There are so many billions upon billions upon billions of stars. And yet your research showed that everything originally came from a speck. And I just can't understand how all the mass, all the energy, whatever, that we see is so vast, could somehow all be so small. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I said that one is that it wasn't actually a speck. Um, the story that you see in the popular press is not correct. So the universe is infinite now. It was infinite when it was young, so there's not like a pre-existing thing into which this kind of speck pops up. So that's a you know, conceptual story that we've been given that's wrong because of, we gave the name of the Big Bang, and I'm thinking of a firecracker. So we can go back and talk about that part some other time, because it's startling to people to be told that they're wrong about if we all believe. Uh, but the scientific story has been communicated incorrectly everywhere. So uh, nevertheless, it is remarkable that the universe was very much compressed when it was young, and that indeed, uh, the entire part of the universe that we could see was indeed compressed to a very small volume. And we can't help it. We just run the expanding universe backwards in our minds, and that's what you get. So it's, it's in a way very simple. We saw it expanding. Imagine how you, how you run it backwards, and you get to where you can understand it. So your question is actually the hard question. <laughs> we to where you can understand it, and we call it something like the Big Bang. So what she says, what's a star? Well, a star is something like the sun. It's a cloud of gaseous material, mostly hydrogen and helium, two of the basic chemical elements held together by gravity. And they are hot enough inside that they have nuclear reactions to turn the hydrogen and helium into other elements and release energy. So a star is a nuclear reactor in space. And why does it have so much energy? Because the atoms are just so important. Um, it has so much energy because it's compressed by gravity until the atoms are close enough to have the nuclear reactions. So gravity is our friend. It makes stars happen. And if they weren't, if it weren't gravity, we wouldn't have stars. Okay, I question mark over here. Okay, so, um... So in the universe, if with all those stars, uh, do you know why the... why... Uh, why the universe is expanding? So, do I know why the universe is expanding? Not really. And I don't have a question. For the, uh, you know how the Hubble, the Hubble could only see to a certain point in the past, and then James Webb can see further in the past, 
Will it be possible to see? Um, it, um, uh, will it be possible uh, later in the future when you have better technology uh, to have another telescope that would continue further in the past than the day as well? Oh, good question. <coughs> on yeah, so the, the question is really is how far back in time can you see? How far back in time can you see? And um, we actually got as far back as you can see. I showed you that picture with the pink and blue box in the back. That's as far as we can see with a telescope. That was when the universe was only 400,000 years old. So then, we, then there's nothing particular to look at until those first galaxies turn out. So that's the question. When did nature give us something else to look at? And we think we built the right equipment, but we could always imagine something better. Astronomers always want a better telescope. <laughs> we have one over here. Okay. That was a statement for the uh can you repeat it? The pictures are from the James Webb telescope. It's not So yeah, that microphone is your here. Okay. Okay. So question here in front. And my question is you mentioned uh, about imagining the light the, the color of light that we can't see, so I I had just finished Ed Young's book, Immense World, he talks about he can recreate like Christmas the way a dog sees his arts poems can do that, but other things there's no point. Yeah. So how how do you color things so yeah, so it's gonna man? Yeah, so anyway, thanks for mentioning Ed Young's book. It's a wonderful book. And it tells you uh, how dogs can smell in stereo. Look at that. Anyway, coming back to our story, we color the pictures in more or less the same order of colors. For the short wavelengths, people see are blue. Uh, one wavelengths we see red, and between have the yellow and green. So we make our artificial colors the same way. We have multiple images taken at different wavelengths, and then we put them in the more or less the same order. So it makes sense to us when we're looking at it. So we do our best to make it meaningful as well as beautiful. We have one up here. Okay. If the universe is like expanding, what is the universe like? If the universe is always expanding, what is there beyond the universe for it to expand to? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, right. Not it. Is, 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 we have that question because people think that the universe is finite. But it's actually infinite. So an infinite thing that can expand into itself. That's what I think or not. So it's an infinite universe that's expanding into itself. So another way of thinking about it is space is just stretching. And space is how we can actually measure it. It's the same thing. So the, the fusion reaction of hydrogen and helium is in a star in our sun. Are there also neutrons being cre created? And is it so hot that the, the nuclei and the electrons are disassociated? Are they separate? And then another question is, uh, what accounts for the motion of the planets around our sun, sort of in, a, in a one plane and in one direction? Why is that? OK, thank you. That good question. It's one about the nuclear reactions inside a star. And so basically, what we've got is we've got hydrogen, which is protons, and helium, which is a uh, helium nucleus, is two protons and two neutrons squeezed tightly together. And then they, uh, they react together, and the uh, protons get converted into neutrons, and energy is released as we make hydrogen, helium out of hydrogen. It's sort of the original thing they grasp the grasp. So that's the, the nuclear reaction that power is So they disassociate them? Uh, they're not really disassociated, they're converted. So it's a long story. Now, your other question was how come the solar system is flat and everything's over here in the same direction? So it's pretty similar to what you see in the sink when you stir the water up and it runs down the drain. You think of a nice sort of spiral pattern. Because as the material is pulled in towards the center, it spins faster. Um, you know, so just like you see the ice skaters spin faster when they throw their arms in. So that's a similar thing to what happens seemingly everywhere in the sky. Everything that spins gets to be flat. So, 
That's how the solar system was formed out of a rotating object, and it spun faster and faster as it shrank. We have the object in our sun. Our sun and the whole nebula that it formed from. Yeah. We so. have one over here. Okay. Um, matter is like not created nor destroyed. So, like, what are we taking from the sun when we're using solar? <laughs> well, actually, it's a little tricky here because um, when uh, hydrogen and atoms merge together to make helium, a little bit of matter is converted into energy. So Einstein said it would happen, and that's true. It does. And by the way, uh, when you think about fusion reactors that we need to build here on Earth to make electric power, I'd like to remind people we have a nuclear reactor in the sky that comes up every morning. Free power distribution, all about your hands. So I think that that's the nuclear reactor we've got already. So, okay, more questions. Okay. Okay. Um, what is, what is, uh, Oh, who wants to know what is dark matter and dark energy? I knew I'd tell you. One of the hardest problems of science right now, we, we don't get there, they're doing something, and we work really hard to measure something, and it's almost impossible to tell. So, maybe you'll figure it out. Maybe a future scientist will figure out a way to know, but we don't know now. 
don't know if this is working, but I can speak loudly. One of the original slides you had was a measurement to your hand and then a measurement to earth. And you said something earlier that we could never get out of our own. I thought you said solar system, but maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, physically, we, we do this not really an awful lot now to get out of the solar system. The fastest we can go is that we send out a couple of probes that have escaped from the solar system to like 50 years. And they're just a teeny tiny distance from the nearest star. So it would take at that rate 100,000 years to get to the nearest star, other star. So we're not going in person. <laughs> So, if I understand, the other picture you showed, there were lots of other solar systems out there. And so, essentially, we could send something that was, didn't have a human in it, and we track it and not destroy ourselves. In the meantime, we could eventually get somewhere else where it would take hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands a year. Is that the point? Yeah, that's the story. We are, of course, imagining things that we could build that would go really fast, push them the laser to the thing called the Breakthrough Star Shop. That we and it broke out, and it would only take 20 years, but it's only like that big. So if you can do it, you would never know that it got there. Kind of defeats the purpose. We unfortunately are out of time. Thank you so, so much.